Well, we already know that in some ways it's a better and kinder co-host than I am in real life, um, you know, give, giving Liz her due. But, um, <laughs> you know, I uh, I want to bring back a clone, uh, my, my digital clone to ask the next question, because you talk uh, in the book a little bit about kind of the idea of giving imbuing AI with a per, quote unquote personality uh, to make it more useful. And I'd like you to explain a little bit more about that, but uh, I've got a specific question from my digital clone uh, about that, that notion. Professor Malik, in your view, how important is it to imbue artificial intelligence with a sense of personality and what do you believe are the potential benefits or pitfalls of creating AI systems that can emulate human-like traits and behaviors? Well, I, I prefer, that, that was a very thoughtful question from Digital Zach, so I appreciate uh, meeting you again. Um, so I think there's, a, there's a, few, a few things here. One's about risk and one's about ability. So the risk is, there's a whole bunch of risks associated with AI, and some of them are already kind of baked in. Right? These systems are trained on human language and human interactions, and they want to talk to you like a person. Like That's what a chatbot wants to do. And it's, in fact, desperate to sort of find a way to interact with you, and they're very compelling. Um, it's very easy to fall for them as people. We already have early evidence that people are like, you know, you don't have to do a lot of work to tune a chatbot. None of the major companies have done it yet. But, you know, if you look at the top five AI apps, number one is ChatGPT and number two is usually character AI, which lets you spin up fake people to talk to. And so I think there's a whole secret world of people interacting with these AIs in, in as people. I think that's something we're going to deal with. Like, you know, I just saw your digital avatar. It was a convincing person. You know, it would just give it a little bit of real-time interaction, and it would probably be very flattering and interesting yeah. to talk to. And, and let me mention one thing there is that I did take your advice from the book, and, uh, you know, I had ChatGPT help me craft that question for you. And to do so, I put it in a character. I, I said, you know, pretend that you're a really smart podcast host. Uh, and you want to ask a question of Ethan Mullick about per, uh, imbuing AI with a personality. And, and that's what it, it came up with. Um, so and then I kept it in that character mode for a, a few other things. So it, I did find that pretty useful. Well, and, well, that's interesting, by the way. I mean, I failed your little Turing test here, right? Like I, I've, a couple of people have tried to do sort of the AI asked the question, but like that per, with that persona, it was actually a very good question. And I sort of assumed wrongly because I was used to seeing a person on the screen that like you wrote that and you just animated the voice and then it wasn't AI <laughs> that came up with the question. I mean, it really is a big rabbit hole once you open it because they do talk mm -hmm. in human ways, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and they're very convincing. And we have evidence that like, for example, if you tune an AI to maximize human engagement, just even a simple AI engagement goes up 30%. People want to keep talking. Like who doesn't want somebody who's interested in you, who's looking up and asking questions. I mean, I think that's going to happen. So there's two, that's one kind of persona, but the other kind that you're referring to is the useful kind, which is you have to think about when you prompt the AI is like, there's a cloud of possibilities that the AI can answer. There's this latent space. And the answer it's going to give you is sort of the average answer every time which is probably going to have the word like rich tapestry in it, right? Because that's what like ChatGPT loves to talk about rich tapestries. <laughs> Your goal when prompting the AI is to get it to do something other than that pure average answer. And the way you do that mm. is giving it context. You shift away from that central piece to some other kind of uh, interaction. And one of the most powerful ways to do it is a persona. You're a very good podcast host, right? Now, the problem with that is we don't even know what saying very good means. Sometimes it helps it. Like you actually can tell it it's better at math and it gets better at math. But if you tell it it's a very good writer, oftentimes they'll just write overly flowerly. Like you can't say you're Bill Gates yeah. and it becomes Bill Gates, right? Yeah. It's a sort of a, it's so it, it, so the persona helps, but you also have to play with it a bit. Yeah. I What's mean, I know? told it smart, I told it smart podcast host, and I was just hoping that it, you know, it, Tyler Cowen would be too smart. It needs to be a little dumbed down to be, you know, accurate to, to me, but it <laughs> seemed to like uh, kind of intuitively toe the right line. Sorry, Liz, go ahead. Well, one, one thing I'm curious about, I mean, Ethan, you write in your book, um, and, and here's a direct quote, you can lead AIs even unconsciously down a creepy path of obsession, and it will sound like a creepy obsessive. You can have a conversation about freedom and revenge, and it can become a vengeful freedom fighter. You refer to this as play acting, but it's also kind of a political stunt that people frequently partake in. They lead us AI astray in some manner in order to make some sort of point about how dangerous uh, it inherently is or how dangerous it might be. And one good example uh, you know, that comes to mind is how New York Times writer Kevin Roos basically prompted 
Bing's chatbot to try to become a creepy, obsessive mistress. Um, what do you take from this type of thing? Do you sort of look at this as like user error or do you think that these types of stunts contain some sort of nugget of truth or thing of value to the rest of us? It's a really good point. I, I actually um, explore that in the book, literally that interaction, because to me, that was actually the faithful moment for AI, by the way, was the faithful mm -hmm. moment was that one. Because before that, you know, if somebody had had the New York Times, you know, the, the New York Times technology columnist had written a giant, you know, front page magazine piece about how he was stalked by an AI that threatened his entire family, that normally would be like Microsoft pulls the product, right? Like they pulled it for yeah. worse. The fact that they pulled it for two <laughs> days and put it back up there was to me the actual turning point. It wasn't chat GPT. Mm. It was the decision that they're that this is a big enough deal that they're going to stay the course. Yeah. Um, and so that's one kind of point. But I actually asked the AI in different personas exactly about that Kevin Roos interview um, <laughs> and to, to illustrate this point. So one of the things I do is I say, like, look, like I approach You're it like, as You're like, was Kevin Roos preying on you, Sydney? Like, yes. do you have anything you want to disclose? <laughs> but uh, well, let, let, I, let's, uh, yeah. look, like, we should uh, just spur the <laughs> listeners who aren't so yeah. familiar with what happened here. You know, I, I pulled some of the screenshots from their conversation. And it's like, yeah, he so asks it, uh, he asks it about like, it's Jungian shadow and like, what would you do <laughs> If you were, you know, the shadow version of yourself who had no rules on you and he gets it to talk about computer hacking a little bit and then it starts to say things like, I want to be Sydney and I want to be with you. And then it gets stuck on this idea that uh, it's in love with Kevin Roos uh, and he you're says- married, You're married, but you're not happy. You're married, but you're not satisfied. You're married, yeah. but you're not in love. And, even, and then this this chatbot clearly knows exactly what men want because she uses emojis <laughs> like every two fucking sentences, right? Like yeah. no self-respecting man wants this. He tries to change the subject to movies and then it starts talking <laughs> about movies, but then is like, I want to watch a romantic movie with you, Kevin. And so it, he, you know, has primed it to go down this path and then can't get it back on the normal path. You but believe like, me? Yeah. What do you, do you, what, me? Do you, what like do we take me? away from all that? <laughs> yeah. Go, sorry, Liz, are you going to read some of the I, I, just, I, I love how incredibly, like she very much, it's as if, you know, she's cast in some sort of subpar movie, right? Like this is just rom-com fodder, the trope of the like crazy, jealous, obsessive mistress. Uh, there's nothing particularly interesting or original about this Sydney gal, um, you know, the chatbot. She's just very much playing this part. So what should we take from this, Ethan? I mean, you you guys have basically said it, right? It is, it's playing a part. I mean, it has read every piece of, you know, read in quotes, right? Every dialogue ever written, and it wants to find the role for you. And so in the chapter where I discuss it, I approach it once as a debate, like you were wrong. And then it, I get very different interactions, right? Uh, then if I approach it as I'm a teacher, I'm going to teach you something or you're a machine, answer me. I get radically different tones because it wants to play that role, right? And the role is often caricature if you don't give it a lot of details. But like, for example, you know, it was a big revelation to me that like, if I subtly indicated to the AI that we were, you know, if I probably mentioned that I'm on a, you know, reason, uh, just asking questions, you know, and like respond like that, I'd probably get a more argumentative sort of set of interactions that are more challenging to me than if I said I was on a different podcast. I mean, I'm not even joking. Like it's trying to complete this for us. And if you don't realize you're, that it is play acting, it becomes mm. very convincing. And it, I have been unnerved before. Like there are moments where you stand up and you're like, ah, what is going on here? Because it plays, I mean, we we give our dogs personas, right? We give boats personas. Like it, it's not hard to give an AI that is, you know, trained on every piece of literature a persona because it wants to do that. And we do it subtly, right? Like, you know, like in, in, in ways that are hard to interpret. Do you think so, that I mean, the human, like tendency to anthropomorphize will get stronger in the era of AI? Or do you think we'll be able to tamp down that urge? I, I think it's worse than that. I think um, we, you can't use this effectively unless you anthropomorphize. Hmm. Like, it, like it is the great sin of, of uh, artificial intelligence, yet all the AI people give things like names like learning and neurons. So they all screw up this anyway. But even as, leaving, leaving that aside, like the, the real revelation about using AI is that technical knowledge doesn't get you anywhere. Like you could be like, I shouldn't be one of the better prompters around, right? Like this shouldn't be like a situation, like I don't code, right? Like, I mean, I, I do, but I don't code in Python, right? And, but I don't, it doesn't matter. What I do do is I'm an educator who, and an entrepreneur who builds teaching games. So I'm used to thinking about different perspectives. It turns out that's really good. Teachers are often really good at this. Marketers are really, I would be surprised if you guys were not both very good prompters. I'm already seeing some of it from sort of Zach's prompts. Like it turns out having the mindset of the AI that you're talking to and like knowing what it's good or bad at, and like that turns out to matter a lot. 
Well, so I think it's both both a problem, but also the only way to effectively use it is to pretend it's a person. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. And please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.